Welcome, welcome everyone to what is a chilly Joburg uh, early evening. It's two minutes after six o'clock, and we welcome you to this what is our pro provincial legislature uh, webinar to discuss really the city's budget as well as, amongst other things, the budget vote seven and the budget vote seven report. Joining me in the conversation is uh, I know we call you Honorable Litsualo, but I'm going to call you Litsualo. How does that sound? Is that okay? Sounds okay. Sounds okay. I mean, it's not Good like uh, you are born with these titles. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. Also joining us, Kim Mekekana. How are you, Mekekana? Are you well? Excellent. I just ask that you try and take your phone, uh, or rather your computer, and put it so that we can hear you. It seems like your sound has muted you. Do you want to try that again? Oh, sorry, I had there muted. we go. There <laughs> Thank we you go. very there much, and thanks for having me. Thank you, and of course, uh, the indomitable Fasia Hassan. How are you, Fasia? Thank Hassan. you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Excellent. So we we have we do have quite a, a strong conversation piece today, and I'm looking forward to what will be the next few minutes that you and I will spend together. What I hope to do really is to get your thoughts right at the beginning of this conversation. Following that, we will see if there are any pieces of conversation for us to facilitate. And then as a penultimate to that, I will take questions that will come through from the people who've joined us on this webinar. There are, as we speak now, 82 people, excluding us in this webinar. We are a minute and 44 seconds in, so our expectations is that that number should increase because we've got well over 250 people that have been registered for this conversation. That notwithstanding, Let's start, if I may, first uh, with you, Ndadilitswalo, in terms of our conversation today and what it is that you feel that the residents of the good uh, province of Gauteng need to understand. What would you like to bring to our attention today? No, thank you very much and uh, good evening to, you know, participants of uh, the session uh, this evening. Uh, so maybe just to you know, introduce myself, I'm the chairperson of uh, the petitions a standing committee, and I, I always refer to it as a quite a unique uh, committee, because whereas other committees I would deal with, uh, you know, departmental budgets, mm. ours uh, is actually poised to deal directly with uh, issues that might be raised by ordinary members of uh, you know different uh, uh, sections of our community. So, if you will, uh, you know, a society at large, right? And it's called right. Uh, the petitions. Uh, a committee. But I think uh, of uh, utmost importance and worth of uh, noting is that to understand uh, you know, the working of uh, the legislature, which is uh, rather the provincial parliament, if you will, is to really go a step back in understanding the overall morphology of our of our democracy, which is a, a constitutional one. Right. And what you find there is that there are two underpinnings in that mm -hmm. uh, the one aspect of our, our democracy is that it's both a, a, a participatory as well as a representative. Mm. So the mm. citizens of uh, you know the country would, uh, from time to time, uh, elect uh, you know uh, their representative. Mm. And these are you know the president uh, that you see uh, you know in office, deputy president, uh, and obviously ultimately you will see that even in the provinces. There's an mm -hmm. appointment of, uh, you know, uh, members of, of the executive council. So what you otherwise mm -hmm. would call the MECs. The yeah, MECs, that's right, yeah. And with, uh, with uh, the provincial provincial legislature, is that uh, the role that we play there is really about ensuring that there's greater accountability. Mm -hmm. And also ensuring that there's, uh, you know, scrutiny. But be that as it may, I think uh, the quintessential thing is that in all of those processes, members of society are empowered you know to take part in uh, uh, decision making uh, processes of uh, of government because at any rate remember through that aspect of uh, you know participatory democracy uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, rather you know underpins the legitimacy of a representative democracy mm -hmm. so members of uh, members of uh, parliament members of uh, the provincial legislature uh, the ministers that are appointed, the MECs that are appointed, are not appointed uh, to represent uh, mm. their own temperamental interest. But uh, mm. the intention really is to ensure that they live through 
uh, to the aspirations of uh, you know the electorate. So these are people that would have given them a mandate, and I think uh, mm -hmm. that is, you know the nature of our democracy. And I think uh, that is really the starting point to understand the, the nature of our constitutional democracy and how ordinary you know citizens can hold uh, uh, you know different uh, sections of a government accountable to ensure that uh, they do as uh, they would have uh, committed or would be expected as per the mandate given to you know uh, the representative uh, uh, leadership so i think uh, those are some of uh, the 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 key points that uh, our participants uh, might want to you know take uh, a note of excellent thank you very much for that introduction um Mekana, if i could come to you now um to to help us i think facilitate and understand a few things. And I approach this conversation uh, with the presumption of ignorance on my part, because I think a big part of what we need to do as uh, public servants and as members of particularly the legislature and the province is to educate those amongst our citizens who are not as close to how uh, the province and the provincial legislature actually works. And so what I will deliberately do is to ask you certain questions from a premise of ignorance, because I'm hoping that as you're explaining it to me, you're explaining it to what is now over the 100 people in on this conversation. But, you know, the 2020-21 financial year budget presents the first budget of the sixth administration. Of course, the Gauteng Provincial Government adopted the Growing Together, Gauteng Growing Together 2030 roadmap. This is the GGT 2030 roadmap. Now, I'm aware that key parts of that roadmap, the blueprints that lied around uh, um, creating Gauteng City region of the future. It was around addressing unemployment, poverty and inequality. What else has been a part of that GGT 2030? And in, in, in particular, how it's affected uh, in this budget? Maybe just unmute yourself there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, I think uh, you're asking a very important question. And I think as a Honorable Lutzwale has already covered, our key role is to actually um, work on public participation, lawmaking, as well as a uh, oversight. Mm -hmm. So our key responsibility would be obviously to play oversight over the departments mm -hmm. and especially the GGT 2030, as you have outlined, mm -hmm. to ensure that this budget process, you know, they are able to bridge the is able to bridge the gap between the planning, budgeting, and ensuring that mm -hmm. there is strategic allocation of resources, of resources. towards mm -hmm. the, the programs that the, the department has set them has set out to to achieve. You know, mm -hmm. and most mm -hmm. importantly, to ensure that uh, there is efficient use of resources. And mm -hmm. so that at the end, we are able to see the impact of the resources that are allocated in this budget, the impact on the society, because what uh, we have set out to do is to ensure that in terms of social development, we eliminate hunger mm -hmm. and poverty, you know, mm -hmm. try to bridge the inequality gaps, get, you know, reduce poverty, unemployment, and inequality in our society. Mm. So that's our main focus because we want to ensure that indeed those deliverables are achieved and to ensure mm. that uh, there's minimal or there's no corruption at all in the department mm. overseeing mm. the budget allocation and resources are you know, well uh, uh, utilized to ensure that we realize the objectives of the department and also mm. to ensure that the transparency and efficiency in, in, in expanding those deliverables uh, that the department has set them has set out to, to, to achieve. You know? Absolutely. Asiha, let me bring you in here if I can. Probably the most forgotten demographic in South Africa is youth. We remember them for a 24-hour cycle in what is a 365-day annual season. Um, and in the 24-hour cycle, it's usually on the 16th of June, we talk about youth, we make youth the center of the conversation. But you can't in South Africa um, 
avoid the fact that many of the young people in South Africa, and because of the, of Gauteng and its importance in, in, in our country, young people are excluded. How do we ensure that we build a province that considers, thinks about, works around, and builds mechanisms and systems to ensure that young people are included, one. And two, how does that influence how we budget and how we execute that budget, uh, not only as the province, but more importantly, those of us who are citizens? Quite, quite, quite right, Busi. I think the first thing we need to note is that, and this is the scary part, young people are marginalized and are on the periphery, mm. and yet we make up the majority of the mm. population. Um, if you look at the numbers, mm -hmm. Stats SA releases them every six months, the majority of the population is under the age of 35. Um, and I think mm -hmm. the more scary part, the thing that should keep us all up at night, is that mm -hmm. given these numbers, what we're seeing is that unemployment rates are acutely high amongst young people. And further to that, yeah, that is independent of education level. So what we're saying is that even mm -hmm. if you have a master's or PhD, you also will struggle to find a job or find mm -hmm. difficulty in finding meaningful employment in your lifetime. And I say mm -hmm. that because I think that's really where our focus kind of needs to be. It's not just about, and I agree with you, by the way, that young people, we only remember this month. I always say, to, I even said to my family recently, June 16th is like the busiest day of my year because everybody wants to hear, on, hear from us on that day, but they don't really necessarily want to hear after. Um, and they mm -hmm. also don't want to have difficult conversations when young people say, mm -hmm. well, we're on the periphery, we're fighting to get back in. Um, what kind of mechanisms do we need? Now, how does mm -hmm. that relate to the budget? Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have to do, and I think it was very well outlined by uh, Honorable Letsualo and Honorable Kekana, how, sort of how the process works. But a lot of what our job is to say, who are these excluded groups of society? Young people, mm -hmm. yes. Women, people living with disabilities, LGBTQIA+, mm -hmm. and of course, the poorest of the poor. And what you then need to look at is the different government programs that exist. You can talk about growing Gauteng together and say, well, what mm -hmm. is the impact on young people? What is the impact on women? And if it's a negative impact, we then need to put in the right policy buffers and the right sort of interventions so that we're actually creating a positive and beneficial solution. So let me give you one example. So it's not just airy fairy. One of the big things that we're pushing right now around tourism, right? We know the tourism hmm. sector is also decimated because of COVID-19. We're pushing mm. the Houghton Tourism Authority to be, or, or to sort of say, in the process of rebuilding the tourism economy, you need to be using young people, number one, to skill them, right? Not just mm. throw them out uh, mm. after using them for a short period of temporary work, but number one, to skill them. And number two, provide meaningful employment so that when we have these different exhibitions and the different um, uh, sort of supports to hotels, et cetera, et cetera, we bring in young people into that space. And, and that's just right. an example of, of what we're doing. Right, and of course, it's not it's not a it's not a finite program, right? So, th the point about it is that there is no end point. We're going to have a lot of work to do, and it's a constantly growing, constantly morphing pro pro program because the issues that we're dealing with, uh, isn't it, in Dadilit sort of themselves, are very complex, and those issues themselves are morphing and changing. So, you know, without getting into the details in particular about how the budget is constructed, because I, you know, I think we could, although I do think we would miss the opportunity to do so, uh, to do if we were to do that. I think perhaps the greater focus for us should be around what are the main issues that are on the table at the moment as it pertains to this particular budget first? And secondly, how do we as citizens engage and involve ourselves in how those issues are addressed? how those issues are aligned to our priorities and how those issues find agency in our everyday experience of the Gauteng province that we live in. Yeah, well, I, well, I suppose uh, my colleagues I would speak to the issue around the budgets because uh, they, I mean, they are, they are committees are poised to scrutinize, but as well as, uh, you know, assess mm -hmm. Uh, budgetary mm. constructs as opposed to the petitions committee which uh, mm. as, I, as i would have said earlier uh, you know focuses on a different uh, mandate and not mm. necessarily departmental uh, uh, budgets but be that as it may i mean uh, the petition what i want, system, what I want uh, to understand sorry if i may what i want to understand from you particularly in terms of that petition system because my understanding of it and if i'm ignorant please sure. correct me 
But my understanding of it is that that petition system is precisely what brings you closer to what are the issues on the ground that are experienced every day by citizens. And what I'm trying to understand from you is what, what are those issues? No, definitely. And, and I think what becomes uh, quite critical um, uh, to note is that uh, the petition system um, rather offers a voice, you know, to, to uh, the citizenry of uh, the Republic. Uh, to be able to also, you know, get involved, uh, number one, in decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, voice uh, their opinions in so far as what they think uh, mm -hmm. should be, you know, prioritized, uh, you know, uh, uh, programs or interventions that might, you know, be necessary to unlock a certain things, you know, that might, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, advance uh, their their interest so if you will the petition system it's uh, both uh, a ventilation a point uh, mm -hmm. but also a feedback uh, you know platform in that uh, mm -hmm. you are then enabled to to assess uh, the work of the government uh, through that platform and i will tell you mm -hmm. one of the things that we mostly come across uh, in dealing with uh, petitions and the analytics of it is that you have got uh, quite a plethora of uh, you know petitioners uh, lamenting the overall uh, program around the delivery of, uh, you know, housing. And I mm -hmm. think that comes up uh, quite often in that uh, people would have uh, applied for uh, RDP housing, you know, some years back. And then uh, years later, they would still not have uh, been allocated, uh, you know, uh, housing. And mm -hmm. I think that in essence says that there might be certain uh, shortcomings in so far mm -hmm. as uh, government's uh, delivery program. Mm -hmm. you know, to ensure that uh, there is a qualitative, uh, you know, service uh, provision and mm -hmm. within reasonable, uh, you know, uh, timeframes. And I think mm -hmm. the petition at least uh, offers, you know, uh, that recourse to ensure that people are able to lament, mm -hmm. uh, but not only lament, even a cause for, for corrective, uh, you know, interventions mm -hmm. that will mm -hmm. ensure, you know, the overall uh, efficiency of, uh, uh, of government. And, there's quite a, a number of uh, examples that we can uh, uh, that we can cite. I mean, in other instances, you have got uh, communities which would, you know, call for a building of original schools. You know, and mm -hmm. we find that it's a it's a critical uh, a tool that ensures that we pressure government, you know, to be able mm -hmm. to become much more responsive. Because uh, remember, in the provision of uh, you know uh, uh, a service delivery. There's the whole question about government having to be responsive to the plight mm -hmm. as well as uh, the aspirations of, uh, you know, members of uh, the community. Because at any rate, I mean, these are people that would have elected, you know, uh, people into, you know, the representative institutions that we that we are leading. So I think uh, the petitions committee is, is an enabler, you know, in more ways mm -hmm. than one. In that, uh, mm -hmm. where, whereas something might, uh, you know, be coming uh, a short uh, of being materialized by a particular line function department. Uh, people would then uh, approach us as the petitions committee. And mm -hmm. I mean, the powers in pure within us is that uh, we're able to, to summon, we're able to, you know, subpoena a government to, to give a much more sense and clarity around uh, what might be some of the bottlenecks and so far as uh, those uh, service delivery uh, provisions. So, those are some of the issues, and there's uh, actually yeah. quite a number of those that would have, uh, you know, denoted. But I think your colleagues uh, will speak to those. There, there is, and if I may, just jump in here, a burning platform. And the burning platform is that our country, as we speak, and the citizens of our country, mm -hmm. and by extension, Gauteng being the economic node of our country, the citizens of our, of our province as well, are growing increasingly impatient. Uh, the both health as well as socioeconomic effects of this COVID virus cannot be overstated at a time like this. And then you juxtapose that with the taxi strike protests, shutdown, uh, call them as you will, that we're experiencing today. And it's pretty clear that the citizens of the province are growing increasingly impatient with the rate at which they are experiencing the delivery of services. And of course, there is a, a, there's a, a connection here that I need you to help me with, uh, Megagan. And in particular, this connection is around the work that we need to do 
around keeping departments honest and true to what it is they are expected to do, but at the same time making sure that we don't have so many checks in the systems, we slow down the rate at which services are being delivered. Now, how do we achieve that? How do we ensure that citizens have agency and that issues get dealt with with a sense of urgency that they deserve, but at the same time, make sure that we have a state that is liable to its citizens and kept true to how it delivers services to those citizens. Uh, do, have you got any thoughts there for us? And then I want to get Fasi, Fasia's thoughts on this. Okay, thank you, Vose. You know, my view in the committee has always been to say to the department, you've got these big budgets that you, you spend mm. and on various programs that you, mm. you, you have designed. Mm. But the community out there, does not know about these programs. Mm. So my emphasis is that the department should be able to improve its communication strategy. They must be able mm. to talk to the people so that the people are aware of the services that the government is, 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 is putting out there. You know, right. you spoke about the area, I mean, this time during COVID-19, there was a food relief programs where people ha would ha apply for food parcels and social grants and so on and so on. But you find that most of the, our people out there don't know about these facilities. So it's very mm -hmm. important that the department get the message out there so that people can access these, these facilities. For instance, mm -hmm. the social development department does have a, a programs for poverty allevi alleviation, sustainable livelihood, youth development, women empowerment, social welfare services, you know, for children and families. But most mm. of our people don't know about these programs and how are they mm. going to access them if they don't know about them? Yet mm. we've got a budget of about 5 billion, 776 million, which is out there and which has been increased by about 200 and 59 million for this uh, financial year. There's a lot of money and we need to ensure as a portfolio committee to ensure that that money goes to those programs and they reach out to those people that so desperately need these services. Because otherwise, if they don't reach out to them, the money is going to go unspent. And that's where malfeasance is going to take place. People will think that there's just money lying around instead of using the money for the intended beneficiaries. So our focus is to ensure that that money is spent where it's needed the most. It's spent efficiently and prudently. So that, that's our main focus, you know. Fasiha, if I can, we've got a question from Musi Moraka, not to be mistaken with Musi, but Musi Moraka. Musi asks and makes the comment. He says, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the, the extent of inequality, poverty, and high levels of vulnerability in South Africa. Now, social warriors such as yourselves have been lamenting and speaking about this for a really, really long time. And there clearly here is a disconnect between the rate at which those of us who live the reality make people aware and the extent to which those who control resources respond to those realities. And I suspect as he goes on to make the point, he says, we need a more comprehensive social welfare and socioeconomic development program that will address these challenges at a local level, right? Now, the budget is, 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 is clearly, you know, we've got now budget vote seven, and this is the issue that we're talking about, is this budget vote seven. But the question I'm asking is, what do we need to do at a, at a legislature level to ensure that we move with speed and haste around addressing these issues? Because, because the virus has definitely made those issues more exacerbated. And all you need to do is to go on to social media on any particular day and you can tell that there's increasing angst, anxiety, and, and levels of uh, uh, social distrust in South Africa that are brewing. And we need to clearly capture those. Have you got any thoughts to offer for us around what it is we, you think we should be doing and how that then is informed by the budget as we are discussing it? No, definitely. I think Musa's question is very pertinent given where we are now. And I think mm. COVID has really exposed um, sort of the fault lines in our society. And in mm. some ways, it's very important also for us to note that the bu budget that we were debating is actually, I mean, 
they haven't yet presented the adjusted budget, formally speaking, after COVID. Right. So a lot right. of what we're going to tell you is the more long-term interventions, but I fully am cognizant of the fact that Musi is asking us about the now. Um, so let me try and speak a little bit about that. One of the things that I think, and I'm sure Honorable Kekana will agree with me on this, that COVID-19, or even before this, we were doing food hampers, food parcels, et cetera, um, to the mm -hmm. communities, but it was in a lot, mm -hmm. on a lot less of a scale. It was a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. what happened is COVID-19 happened and uh, really it exposed our lack of streamlined processes uh, to mm -hmm. really provide social relief to the poor. And that, this is just one mm -hmm. example. As of now, the numbers are sitting at at least 33% of the population of Gauteng are currently food insecure, given mm -hmm. COVID-19. Huge mm -hmm. amount of given that the majority of the population is here as well. So I'll talk a little bit about what's happening now because I want to be practical, um, but we do have more long-term strategies. Now, one of those long-term strategies is what we call the urban poverty and food security uh, strategy that's currently being revised to reflect mm. the threat that we have, but it's looking mm. at a lot of approach um, to social relief. And, and, and Honorable Gikan will be able to speak to it, but there's two things I want to mention. It's not just about food security, right? We're trying to assist small businesses. We're trying to assist people who've lost their jobs. Um, right now, because I, I, I'm actually here representing the um, uh, oversight of the Premier and Legislature uh, Portfolio Committee. Um, so a total of 41 million rand has actually gone towards township economies from the Premier's mm -hmm. budget. Um, and we've mm -hmm. also pushed them very hard to do a lot of reprioritization. So they've also reprioritized, uh, reprioritized an additional 3 million rand from all these different things that are all particularly going towards COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing I want to just say, if you'll allow me, because I want to tell everybody what we think the numbers are going to be in terms of what it's going to cost the public to look for it. So it's difficult for us to be specific. We don't, it's difficult to quantify rather, but we are looking at an estimation of 40 million rand that we expect mm. that we're going to need to do, deal with the additional capacity to deal with COVID. And that's going mm. to deal with like, our hotline. It's going to deal with the, the provincial command council. It's going to deal with PPE. It's going to deal with the recruitment of um, what we call EWP workforce. So we are mm. still in a phase in which we are, I think, budgeting for something that no one expected, but we also, in a way, we were trying to move things around while at the same time not forego our long-term strategies that we want to deal with poverty for. So it's a very careful balancing act that we have to do. I understand you. Yeah. And of course... And, oh, yes. Please, please go on, Tadele Zolo, make your comment. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of uh, the things that needs to be uh, considered well and I suppose uh, in the aftermath of uh, COVID, which uh, forces us uh, to have uh, conversations about uh, what are some of uh, you know the shortfalls of uh, the current uh, policy construct, is that what you will see is that uh, at the advent of uh, our democracy, I think uh, you know the focus was much more about uh, you know uh, provision of redress, mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but now with uh, you know COVID exposing us to the extent of uh, inequality as you, you know, posit, is that uh, we might be forced to have a conversation about, uh, you know, the urgent need for policy, you know, a reform, uh, such that uh, we are able to catalyze on, on having a, a redistributive edge. Because uh, one of the things which has uh, actually been quite problematic is that we have also created a level of a dependency on, on the system itself mm. without necessarily Data, you know, sustainability. So if you look at the, the SME sector, I mean, it's one of those sectors where you can't necessarily say, you know, you will just as government uh, continue to incubate people without necessarily being able to sustain, I mean, the businesses that they that they establish. So I think uh, so far as, uh, you know, our budgets are concerned, you would want to have uh, budgets which are much more uh, focused and radicalized on, uh, you know, ensuring greater sustainability of those uh, key uh, sectors, uh, which might, uh, in a way, you know, assist to stimulate, uh, you know, the local economy. One of uh, one of uh, the engagements that we would have had was really about uh, how to, you know, fortify, uh, you know, local or township, uh, you know, economies because we have got uh, markets, you know, existing within those spaces. But whether we've, uh, you know, been much more vigorous. The, the, you know, uh, 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 vigorous, yeah, yeah. vigorous uh, in so far as uh, entering and bolstering, you know, uh, businesses within those spaces. 
it's really another question. So I, I really think that the, uh, the, the you know, uh, premise uh, should be a, a review of existing, you know, policy uh, framework mm -hmm. and to assess as well, you know, in the current uh, uh, setting and with uh, the challenges now being exposed, whether those uh, policies uh, would still be as uh, pertinent or whether there might be a need, you know, to have uh, an expansive uh, you know, uh, edge around uh, some of uh, those uh, specific uh, uh, framework. So I, I think uh, we would really need to have uh, a conversation about that if we're ever mm -hmm. going to then in so far as uh, the social economic um, uh, challenges that besets our counter. Mm. I mean, uh, and it's it's interesting that you make that point, right? Because in part, a big part of our failing, and I say our collectively as South Africans, since the dawn of our democracy has been our inability to imagine what an inclusive economy looks like. Sure. Um, the, the fact that we still have a debate raging about should we be formalizing or not formalizing an industry that predates most of us, frankly, the taxi industry has been in our lives and it has been in the black experience. And I use the word black here in its, exclu in, in its inclusive sense, has been a part of our black experience since the 1930s and 1940s. And the fact that we have still been unable to include it in terms of how we formalize and make the city function is a big part of what the challenge is that we're facing. Megakana, I do have a question for you and it's linked to the poll. We're running a poll and we've asked people, do you know the four constitutional mandates of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature? 46% of the respondents answer yes which means there are 53% of the respondents who don't know. Now, just to be clear, there are 110 people in this conversation, over half of them, if you take this by extension, don't know what the four constitutional mandates of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature are. Now, if we were to extrapolate that into the broader society of the Gauteng province, that means we not only have a issue around how citizens get involved, but we more importantly have an issue around how citizens sure. understand what the constitutional mandates of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature are. Without, you know, an academic thesis, if you would for us, just give us a sense of what those would be that we all need to be aware and we can answer that question at the bribe. Of course, it would be a social distancing bribe, you know, just to make the point. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, like like I said earlier, Vusi, uh, uh, that um, ours as a uh, oversight committees is to ensure that uh, we involve as much of the public as possible. So yes. public participation would be our key focus area. So meaning that we need to urge departments to go on community uh, awareness drives, you know, and public right. education as well as a uh, dissemination of information like i said mm -hmm. so that the info uh, the, the public is well informed about their legislature and they know their rights and they know how to access services through the the Houghton provincial legislature mm -hmm. for instance mm -hmm. there was a suggestion that uh, we, we 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 go through the the route of e petitions for instance you know as part of expanding access yeah. to to gpl services E-petition yeah. services would be one of them. And then, like I said, uh, lawmaking. If we conduct this public participation, we get to solicit views of the public out there, which will help us to craft laws that, you know, are relevant to them. Because, uh, you know, policy making is about what the people need. You need to formulate your policy around the need of the people on the ground mm, and not just mm. assume that this is what they want. You, you, mm. you understand? So we need to Completely. involve the we need to involve the public in crafting these laws to ensure that they benefit them at the end. Mm. Do you understand? Absolutely. Yes. And and uh, there's just a, 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 you know, if I may, one of the penultimate questions I'd like to pose, and I'm happy if e any of you takes this question, really. It comes from Muslindi Le Kubeka, who says, um, uh, she asks the following. She says, in fact, I beg your pardon, it's Yunam Dantala, who says, as a follow-up from Musi's comment, um, 
and, and he says, please excuse my ignorance. I take it it's a he. He says, but do we have a provincial disaster act or provision that looks to speculate on possible disasters that could possibly hit our province? Now, it's clearly something around our planning and how do we do scenario planning? And the reason this is important is I want to make, make the next comment. It says, I ask this because it almost feels like in South Africa, read here, Gauteng, everything hits us unprepared by surprise and we're not ready um, to then respond. And we first need to get our responses right, then respond to whatever the current crisis is at that time. Now, admittedly, I do think that as a country and by extension here, the province, we've done very well in terms of our response to this particular crisis. But I wonder if the question must be posed, in particular as it relates to the budget. Do we have set asides that looked for incidentals that are not pre-planned, that are not budgeted for, that may occur, that may impact the long-term planning that you spoke about earlier, Fasiha, and how that long-term planning finds um, fruition and is implemented by the Gauteng province? I'm going to ask, answer a little bit about, about it because I think actually Honorable Letsuala was better placed um, just reading that question. So yes, I think we have to acknowledge that we don't have, I think personally, good enough planning for natural disasters. And we can plan, I think we're more readily available for floods, we're more readily available for droughts, of which we're very uh, used to dealing with. But I think what we were not at all prepared for was a COVID-19 crisis that forced all of us to not just physically distance, um, but has really decimated the economy. And it came at a time mm -hmm. when really did that was the last thing we needed um mm -hmm. in, in terms of economic intervention so to speak so you know i think that we have to concede on that but um there are the, look there are legis there is legislation right there's the disaster management act and we also have to understand that we are on a provincial level so um we are also governed by that national state of disaster so there is the correct sort of legislative mechanisms but is it enough and this is the big question is it enough to to just have those i think we need better strategies and departments mm. that say if there's a scenario of this this is what we're going to do etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. but i think mm. yeah, honorable letsuala when i was reading this i thought about you so <laughs> well, can, can I just, do you want to take a stab at it of, if we if you don't if you'll allow me that it's let's allow me to make a comment first oh. yeah before that letsuala comes in I, I think ideally departments should be budgeting for disaster management, for disaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They should be mm -hmm. setting aside a certain portion of their budget towards disaster relief. So that mm -hmm. when a disaster hits us, we don't start from zero, you know? There should be funds there to assist in the relief of whatever kind of disaster that came. But mm -hmm. in this instance, I don't think that was the case. And I think it's something that as portfolio committees we will have to look and ensure that departments set aside money for disaster management. Mm -hmm. Because I think in, at the municipal level that is happening, but here at provincial level, it's not happening. But I think mm -hmm. that's a good practice so that we are not caught wanting. And, and before you jump in, of course, it, it isn't, we, we must also be alive to the fact that there are competing interests in South Africa, that as we, as we sit, our budget is running at a deficit at a national level. Uh, I saw uh, Ndate Mboweni's projections about where our national fiscus would end up by the year uh, 2021, 2022, some very scary numbers. So whilst it's important that we plan and have set-asides, we also must must consider the realities that we, we don't have a particularly strong fiscus to support some of what we would like to do as a country, by extension, provinces, municipalities, etc. And Tata Litswala, you wanted to make your comment. No, thank you very much. I think uh, Fasia has already, you know, covered part of my uh, input in so far as stating that there is uh, an existing framework uh, which addresses, uh, you know, the emergence of uh, disasters. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the other thing to, to really note is that whilst uh, you might not have individual departments uh, doing set-asides, but even at the mm -hmm. level of the province, what you would have mm -hmm. is that you would have, uh, you know, disaster, disaster relief fund at a central level. So it might not necessarily be with, uh, individual uh, departments. But I suppose... Uh, uh, the challenge has been the encumbrances. So there are encumbrances 
And what does that mean in a sense is that uh, you would have uh, some of uh, challenges related to uh, bureaucratic uh, processes. Because obviously the management and control of uh, you know those uh, particular funds. Because uh, at a at a point at which uh, you know you are collating those, you might not necessarily anticipate the nature of uh, you know the disaster that uh, might come about. So you will see that there is actually quite a stringent uh, requirement. Uh, you know as uh, directed by a treasury around the management of uh, those uh, but i think uh, the the critical thing would be uh, you know expanding on those uh, you know specific uh, you know uh, funds to ensure that they are adequately able to respond uh, to situational uh, you know um, uh, emergencies uh, should they should they arise but in essence uh, there is a there is a central you know provincial uh, disaster relief uh, fund which is intended to address, uh, you know, those uh, kinds of uh, uh, issues. But it's not something that you can just, uh, you know, easily tap into because uh, the mm -hmm. intention really is to address, uh, you know, what you would have already coined as uh, disasters. So you mm -hmm. you can't necessarily, uh, you know, utilize it for for other things because uh, there are treasury, you know, uh, controls ensuring that there aren't any abuses of uh, those uh, of those uh, uh, funds. So. The only thing for me would, uh, if we were to address, uh, you know, the encumbrances, uh, that uh, often makes it quite difficult uh, for provinces to, you know, speedily intervene when uh, different uh, situations uh, arise. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, I'd like to draw uh, to a close our conversation today with this final uh, comment and question, and then I'd like to get your thoughts on each. It comes from Ubongani Gamtembu. He asks the question, he says, uh, rather, I beg your pardon. It actually comes from um, Andrew Chililo. And Andrew asks the question and says, public part participation has been reduced to tick box exercise. Now, that's his assertion. But he goes on to make the point that, on the other hand, citizens are too ignorant of their role in policy formulation. Citizen power must be taken very seriously, not only by politicians, but by citizens themselves. Going forward, and Dadele Zwale, you spoke about the e-petition. Uh, Fasiha, you and I had a conversation about how do we include young people. Mekekane, you've spoken very eloquently about what are the elements that we must be aware of and how do we participate. But going forward, how do we as citizens of the province participate and what are the uh, must-dos that we need to make ourselves aware of as it pertains to the seventh budget vote for the legislature or by the legislature rather? I'll start with you first, Dr. Uh, Lizwal. No, th thank you very much uh, for that. Earlier on, when I when I started, I started by you know unpicking the nature of uh, our democracy. That in essence, it gives uh, you know the citizen rule of the republic, uh, you know, agency. It also enables them to be you know involved. So it's not even a question of uh, having to beg uh, to to participate. Uh, within uh, you know decision making uh, processes but also the processes of uh, of governance and i think uh, what you will see and i would have also spoken to is that to legitimate a representative agency is that we i mean there's a foregone expectation that our people must also avail themselves mm. uh, to participate as in when they're called upon i mean from mm. time to time i think uh, government uh, does a call out for people to get involved either when there's a, you know, development of a legislation, but our observation is that there, there seems uh, not to be a keener interest amongst, uh, you know, the members of, uh, you know, of uh, our different uh, uh, communities. And I think we must uh, be able to get that right. But uh, mm -hmm. in other instances, what we, what we are picking up is the uh, complex or intricate the process of uh, engagement, which I render, you know, the processes uh, to be quite uh, superficial. And I think, We've also spoken to that that we need to ease off on how we, you know, conduct uh, engagements with, uh, you know, the public, so that uh, when that happens, it's actually much more easier. It's a, uh, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it, it, it's enabling, you know, for people to want to participate uh, within the process. But if you will, it's a, it's a symbiotic, uh, you know, arrangement which must uh, be mutually reinforcing. So. Whilst we expect that uh, there should be an enabling environment, you know, uh, marshaled by, by government, uh, mm. the citizens of the Republic must also be willing to, you know, come on board 
as part of a social contract that they have with government. And that is the only way in which we can legitimate, uh, you know, our constitutional democracy. So ensuring uh, active, uh, you know, citizens uh, involvement. So it should not be a question of uh, having to wait. I mean, in other instances uh, with, the, with the petition system, you don't have to wait uh, for something to go wrong. You can uh, petition a uh, government uh, where you might have, uh, you know, an input uh, to make or whether you would want to raise a suggestion so that we, we cause for necessary uh, referrals, referrals and cause for necessary, you know, escalation so that you can be heard. I mean, we, we even create the uh, platforms to, to interface with, uh, you know, different uh, uh, stakeholders within our different, uh, you know, communities. So from time to time, what you will see is that we will go out on external uh, uh, hearings, there will be outreach uh, programs, there will be uh, public, uh, you know, education on uh, specific uh, programs that are being delivered uh, by government. So what I would want to urge uh, through this platform is that uh, government really tries on their part to reach out, but they would, uh, you know, also appreciate if, uh, you know, our citizens or residents of uh, the province could also, you know, in, in turn, uh, you know, be willing to participate within uh, uh, programs uh, designed by government to ensure that their voices are heard to ensure that uh, they participate uh, meaningfully, you know, towards uh, the development of any framework or the process of uh, of governance. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Kana. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Chililo is correct. Sometimes it, it can be very frustrating when you uh, go through these public uh, participation processes where it seems like it's, it's a tick box exercise, you know. I think we, we need to, as government, go aggressively on the civic education programs so that we, 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 we educate and involve our communities as to how to uh, participate in the, this democracy of theirs. Mm -hmm. And also to, 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 to ensure that, uh, you know, they, they, they get meaningful results out of those uh, public participations. Because currently you would find that you would call a public participation for people to engage on transport, for instance. Mm -hmm. And when you go to that uh, transport meeting, people will engage on housing issues and many other issues. Understandably mm -hmm. so. But at the end of the day, you leave the meeting without substance, without mm -hmm. something that you, mm -hmm. you can take back and, and you know, craft policy around. So Absolutely. it ends up being a, 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 a tick box ex exercise. So we need to educate our, our, our communities. Currently, we, we try to select relevant stakeholders for certain topics so that we get meaningful engagements. But mm. it, it doesn't have to be like that. If we say it's public participation, we should be able to open to everyone and everyone must understand this is the topic and this is the objective of the public participation so that we can derive you know, value from that meeting. Absolutely. Fasi, how are your closing comments for us? So very quickly, I, I agree with what my colleagues and comrades have, uh, have really said. And I think it's also important and something I think about a lot around the question of tokenism, um, especially as a young person in this space. So hmm. just having a checkbox, okay, we're here. Um, and there's, it's exactly what uh, uh, my colleagues have specified, but it's also around how we change, and this is on us, how we facilitate public participation. And this is what's quite exciting about COVID in that it's taking us to different spaces of public participation, not just uh, a community hall, which is fundamentally important, but it's not the only place in which we can do public participation. There's other ways in which we can do it, but that's a whole mm. other conversation. Um, there was just quickly one thing I wanted to, one of the questions from Busi was around climate change. And I think this mm. is also particularly mm. necessary. As it stands, we actually have a provincial climate change bill and strategy that's being prepared uh, and will hopefully soon be open for public comment in which we can hear from the public and people what they actually think and feel um, around the issue of climate change. Uh, you know, there's also different, like I said, strategies being um, put forward. But right now, the National Forestry Bill and the Environmental Management Amendment Act, that's the new mm -hmm. name of is currently up for public participation. It hasn't yet hit public uh, comment, but it's just at the NCOP. So we need to inform the public to not just come to these online meetings, but find ways in which we can engage meaningfully beyond it. And that's also why I've shared my social media details and my email, because it can't just be on one platform for 40 minutes now. 
we need to take it beyond it. Um, but I think, you know, this is the beginning of the conversation. I think we need to look at more opportunities like this where we can sit and go through with a fine tooth comb all the different questions, especially around finance, especially around how we're spending the budget um, so that we can say, I mean, I think the South African people are very reasonable. If you sit and talk to a person and you put across the kind of justifications for what you're thinking, you'll find that actually, you know, people are very much willing to be on board and willing to participate in and may even have other ideas. This is my last point. As lawmakers, we don't always have the solutions. Um, and it's also really important for us to go into communities and hear what communities want as the solution. Mm -hmm. We may think very complex. Um, very quickly, we had this thing about farmers. The point is the problem was with the tractors, okay? Now we were thinking high level, we're like, where do we get the skills from? You might have to bring in someone international around the seeds. The problem is with the tractors. And if we didn't listen to the community, we wouldn't have been able to implement that change or that solution. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. don't have all the answers. We've got to work as a collective. We're only as strong as each other. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love it. Thank you all so much for your time. I think it's as the old adage says that the representation of a demographic does not mean the representation of an agenda. And we really do have to go beyond the demographics that we represent to the agendas that we should serve the inclusion of the marginalized, the broadening of the economic base of our province, the increased participation of every citizen, of every part of the social strata in the province. And as a consequence of these, the building of a province that is meaningful and prosperous for all of us who live in it. I want to thank you, Melit Zoalo, I beg your pardon, Nika Kanan, Tatelit Zoalo, as well as yourself, Fasiha, for having joined us in this conversation. For everybody who's joined in this conversation, this webinar will be made live and available by the team at Mail and Guardian. So please follow the notifications for that. And of course, myself, Fasiha, are also on social media, so you can connect and engage there. Thank you, everybody, for having joined us for your time, and have a pleasant evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I do for social distance hugging. You can't hug, so I just. <laughs>